my favorite pre rework is actually Urgot. I think people didn't play him because he was too ugly. But the, <laughs> the actual play style of the character was cool. I think if you replace that Urgot, put in like the model of like some hot sorceress babe who's like <laughs> shooting fireballs instead of like this abomination shooting acid hunters or whatever they're called, people would play the hell out of it. Hello and welcome back to The Dive, season eight, episode number seven. LCS is back. We're back, baby. We're this back. <laughs> yes. Did you miss us? Well, we were always here. It's more, do you miss the I've rest mi- of us? I've missed True. LCS. I've missed it. We were holding, the dive was holding it down. Yeah, the dive was here. The dive was holding it down. I'm excited for the game to be back. Uh, I don't. I want to say, have we ever had a break like this since I started? I don't think we've ever had a, had a break like this. So yeah. it was definitely a, a weird feeling for me to just not have the games. I'm kind of fiending. Uh, I was trying to watch some LCK recently, and they were getting DDoS like crazy. Yeah, what year is it? I feel like we got transported back. I to know the old days. It's crazy. It is. It is so weird. Uh, if you guys hadn't hadn't seen it, this has happened a couple times to LCK now to the point where. They're going to have to basically move their broadcast to, I think they said they're going to do pre-recorded games. They're going to have to do like online games, pre-recorded, then broadcast them because there were so many DDoS attacks and they said it was like not just one person or whatever. It seemed like it was, you know, a bunch of things going on. So kind of some co- coordinated effort to uh, knock off, you know, the LCK broadcast basically. Um, one of the days I want to say they had six or seven hours of delay. Yesterday it was like four or something that I saw last, but I didn't watch it all. Um, so pretty crazy stuff. And it kind of takes me back to my WoW days, to be honest, because I don't know if you ever experienced this in WoW, but DDoS in the old days of WoW was was rampant. Like, this actually terrorized solo queue, uh, well, the ladder. Like, when you got high on ladder, people would DDoS you. Um, when they were doing boosts and stuff like this, they'd be boosting people and they'd DDoS their opponents to get, get more LP. They, they did this in the early days of League also, because I played in online tournaments mm-hmm. in Season 1, um, and people would DDoS you in the tournaments. And yep. We nothing. know what Jensen's doing with his two <laughs> weeks, is all I'm going to say. Should have never given him two weeks off. Nope. What, was, what was his in-game name before? Incarnation. incarnation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Incarnation. Before that, it was like Wizix. But Incarnation is a name he had when he was DDoSing people. I thought that was his reform name. <laughs> okay, okay, never mind. <laughs> whatever, I, I don't know. Whatever don't the know. timeline is, he had, he changed his name a couple times to, yeah. to fix the image. It's it's definitely definitely weird, though, to see this. I, I, I guess ignorantly, I just kind of have had assumed that this was not really a big problem anymore. Because I know in the WoW days, it was all because of terrible security through things like Skype. Yeah, yeah, if you, Skype. if you had someone Skype, you just literally could get their IP address just like that. And then people would use these websites where it was supposed to be a website that tested basically how much traffic your website could handle. So you'd pay a bit of money and it would basically just like send send packets or whatever to your website as though you had a thousand people on it or 10,000 people on it. And they would just do that to your IP and blow up your modem. And But it was like so prevalent back in the day. And I just hadn't heard people talking about it for so long. Um, online tournaments, like you said, in, in League, also in WoW, for anything that was online, pretty much got DDoSed. If you, you had to, before you played any sort of event, you had to change your IP, make a new Skype, like do all this sort of stuff. Dude, Skype was so painful Skype back then. Because like, I, I know when I was streaming, it, if you ever accidentally showed your Skype on the stream, it was like, is over. lights out. Like you are getting DDoSed till you change your internet. Uh, so I was like really, really paranoid of ever showing my Skype. Yep. Yeah, and, I didn't, and as soon as Discord came around, man, it was like a godsend. <laughs> it was like, yes, no more Skype. I, I love Ventrilo. If we're going, if we're going back <laughs> for the. Uh, I mean, Vent, Vent was infinitely better than Skype, but yeah. like, I, I don't know, dude. Discord is like, it's so good. It's yeah. so much better. When I lived in the EG EG programming house in Phoenix, uh, some of the StarCraft players did coaching, so they publicly had their Skypes posted i could see that ending well because it well it, ddosing wasn't a thing really in starcraft mm. but if i ever tried to stream they would just look up their public skypes get the ip and ddos us so i literally couldn't stream for over a year and a half when i lived there oh, which was nice. actually terrible because you made yeah. zero dollars as a pro gamer right yeah most of your money was from yep. streaming um but yeah it was just such a such a problem back in the day so it's it's weird to kind of see it coming back apparently there's all kinds of ddosing problems now uh, in the Korean ladder as well, top pros getting DDoSed and stuff. Um, you know, Emily was was telling us about that earlier. So it's it's definitely too bad that it's coming back, and hopefully they can solve this pretty quickly and, and get back in the studio because it's it's just crazy to think that like one of the biggest leagues in the world of any game 
can be shut down by this. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know enough about internet or whatnot to know like <laughs> how it works or how, how to fix I. it, but they're hacking into the mainframe. Yeah, it, it's. Uh, <laughs> I, put up the I actually feel like if you get caught for DDoSing, it should be like prison time. So I have a, I, mean, I have a wild story. You go ahead. No, yours, yours is funny. I already know the story, so go. Yeah, I told, I told it earlier. So this is a wild story. So there was a, a guy I knew who used to run these online WoW tournaments, and a couple of them in a row were just getting spam DDoS to the point where they were, like, ruined, right? And there was, like, decent prize money online. At the, at the time, it was, like, 10K, which was, like, really good for an online event back then. Um, and the guy actually, like, his day job, he worked uh, at the Pentagon for the Department of Defense. So he, What? So uh, crazy crossover it is a crazy crossover. Uh, so when he was when he was hosting the tournament, like he he was like, oh, I'll I'll, I'll stream it, like I'll host it. So he he VPN through his work network through the Pentagon, and then they tried to DDoS the Pentagon, Ooh. and apparently the people got insta arrested. Good. So it's, that, it was we like, should do all of them through the Pentagon. It was like <laughs> the absolute most like justice after Dude, I love years that. of getting DDoS. I actually time. love that. Do you still so have funny. the contact? Or is this call the LCK? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, get something worked out here. The LCK. Imagine that you're trying to win like a few bucks and you just yeah. you end up DDoSing, DDoSing the, Pentagon the Pentagon and you're just <laughs> a fan in shows I mean, Guantanamo I'll, Bay. Honestly, that's, <laughs> that's some justice porn right it there. Is. That's great. Like, you got what you deserved. <laughs> you're yep. not a little scumbag trying to DDoS yeah. LCK. They got the national defense. Uh, I'm, I'm down. <laughs> yeah, you don't mess with Faker, though. Once Faker's involved, someone's someone's getting in trouble for Yeah, this. you're going in. I mean, I, I was trying to watch LCK last night, um, and the T1 game was... Yeah, like you said, getting DDoS, it was just perma pause, and you know, you know, the craziest part is like, I don't know if you guys were watching; it's pretty late, but they were doing this skit um, where they had these pro players that come out with like masks on and voice changers, and then they do one v ones, and there's like this audience panel who's trying to guess who they are. It was actually cool content, but for whatever reason, they were about to show who like I think it was King Kong or something was. And literally right before they did the reveal, they just started playing a different content piece. And I, I was like, <laughs> I was like, no, you did not just do that. Like they literally just like cliffhangered it as hard as humanly possible. Was it to make you come back later to watch the rest of the I don't know. They did. It feels like they just forgot. They just started showing the wrong video or something. It was crazy. I don't know. That kind but of, I, I want to know who that was. Yeah, that kind of stuff is actually really fun. It's kind of like the, you know, nameplates off. Like, I'm sure you've seen those videos where it's like, oh, guess the ELO yeah. or whatever. But it's like every clip is faker. And people are like, this guy's bronze. He didn't click right in this bush or whatever, yeah. you know. Those kind of things are really funny. And it does actually really challenge people's perceptions around just, like, assuming it's good because it's Zayas doing it or assuming it's bad because it's someone else did it yeah, or yeah. whatever. I think the last one I saw was Dignitas did one super recently. Um, and they were flaming their own teammates because all of the clips were their teammates, their their bottom. <laughs> right. And then after they revealed oh it, they were like, Oh God, please delete the VOD. You know, don't, <laughs> no, don't show this to uh, uh whoever it was. That's, That's pretty funny. crazy. Uh so a couple this is a couple weeks ago, but I think it's an interesting discussion. Um Revenge was on Hotline League and he was talking about you know, how he believed a lot of GMs to be incompetent, how he believed, you know, a lot of coaches weren't very good in the LCS. And also kind of just talking more about, like, holistically what a coach should be. You know, should a coach be an absolute in-game expert who knows the lanes better than you, knows the pathing better than you? Or should a coach be maybe someone who's actually just dealing with, you know, personalities and organizing things and, like, getting everyone moving in the same direction and guiding conversation and depending on the pros, you know, for, for the actual game knowledge. And I just think it's kind of an interesting discussion. And I wanted to get your guys' opinion, and you obviously you played with a, a lot of different coaches, a lot of different GMs and so on, on, like, a, do you kind of agree that there is a problem with coaches and GMs in the LCS? And B, like, what do you kind of see as the ideal? Yeah, uh, I'm definitely, this is something I've talked about a lot, whether it's on, like, co-stream, my stream, whatever. And just to clear it up, like, I, people meme saying I'm, like, a coach hater, like, uncoachable or whatnot, because I, I will beef with my coaches, right? Like, here's the thing. So my issue with it is, like, I've worked with some good coaches, some not as good coaches, uh, but... I think the biggest issue with it is like, I, so you have like the pro gaming thing, like league, LCS, whatever. I think where you run into problems is when you try to fit that into the traditional sports model, which is what kind of has happened with franchising, with, with everything. Uh, because in the beginning, when you had a coach, it was, you know, looking at 2013 C9, our coach was Alex Penn. And he wasn't, he didn't coach us in the traditional sense. It'd be more like maybe how 
Magnus Carlsen works with his chess coach. Like his chess coach isn't telling him what to do, but he's he's helping him improve. So like Alex Penn, he was more like a manager. He like you know he'd have the replay open for us. He would like he wasn't trying to tell us how to play guiding the game. discussion. Yeah, he would be more just like helping the team kind of thing. Uh, but I think what's happened now is uh, a lot of these teams have tried to model it after traditional sports, where the coach is basically like above the players like you have authority over the players there's like this hierarchy and I think that just doesn't work because in a game like league it's not the same as basketball or football where you're calling plays throughout the game and you can time out the only thing the coach does really is talk to your team like for draft and whatever but as soon as the game starts it's only the five players who are actually on the rift doing anything so um I don't know I, I more have an issue with like the coaches having power over the players because i think that just doesn't really work in a game like league Um, yeah i I think there's also some separation necessary in in these different roles when you're describing you know should this be someone that's actually trying to help you with your laning or with your mechanics or you know bringing you a specific vod on something to study Uh, some teams have gone towards you know positional coaches and having that be completely separate from the managerial things Mm -hmm that they're talking about i feel like that is the direction to go and that is a separation that a lot of organizations have done where like you know typical lck head coach role isn't a you know positional coach that's that's trying to help you there and it is it's kind of this authority figure that is laying out structure for the day and and yeah like that rather than um Um, oh yeah sorry so uh what i think coaches can be really good for is um one coach I really liked working with was uh, Zix on 100 Thieves, Tony. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was very good at knowing uh, vision lines, which helps a lot for jungling. Basically, he would say, like, okay, you see this rock on this wall. You can stand here in the mid lane. Minions won't see you. So, like, this is as close as you can get if you're trying to gank mid. And that sort of thing. Or, like, you know, if you're going for a lane gank top and the minions are here, you, you can get into the lane bush kind of thing. So, I think coaches can be, like, don't get me wrong, they can be super valuable and whatnot. It's just hard to, you know, like for the owners and the GMs and whatnot, like how do you know which coach is actually good versus the ones who just say buzzwords, who watch LCK, they read Reddit. Just for a while for me, the the biggest like uh, red flag was this, you know, whole, we need to be proactive, not reactive. Because honestly, that is the biggest fluff statement I've ever heard, right? It's like, they say that and they just consider anything good to be proactive and anything bad to be reactive. It's like, look at how they proactively cause the other team to fail the dive. I'm like, what? Like, that doesn't even make sense, bro. Like, the, the proactive team tried the dive and they messed it up. Like, what are, what are we on about? So, yeah, I mean, it. I think there can be good coaches. I just think it's really hard to di- from the outside to tell who's actually useful or not. So I wanted to push back a little bit on something you said earlier. So you're talking about, you know, you didn't feel like the coaches should be above any uh, of the players or whatever. Yeah. I guess my my question, just kind of devil's advocate you a little bit, is when people aren't agreeing, I feel like you need someone in a position of power to end a dispute, right? Yeah. You need someone to eventually say, okay, Kobe says we should play early game. You say we should play late game. If everyone's on an even playing field, it can become this kind of like endless cycle of argument and disagreement. And that's why I do think it can be useful to have have that coach in a position of power to be able to facilitate conversations, to be able to actually make the final decision because at the end of the day, you have to choose a direction and five people walking in the same direction is always going to be better than, you know, yeah. each people, you know, kind of half the team walking each way. I, I agree with what you're saying. To that point, I would say the most successful team dynamic would probably be, I think you need one player who kind of has more power than the others as far as like a team captain goes. I think that... Uh, trying to have every player be like exactly on the same level is probably going to create more problems because on going back to C9, we kind of followed high as the team captain. It wasn't like, you know, he was the only one telling everyone to do, but we would get behind him if he was really sure about something. Even if we didn't fully agree, we'd be like, you know what, let's make it work. Like, let's try it. Let's do it. So hypothetical. What if they got an extremely good player or would be X player now as your head coach? Um, do you think that would, that would like, would you put that, that's basically taking the team team captain position. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's a player that is very good at League of Legends, is challenger, you know, you know, was a pro, 
Um, so you, you trust them a lot and they kind of get them as like the one with the game view and then just set it up so everyone kind of defaults to that. Because a lot of our teams now actually have a lot of these these ex-pro players as their coaches, like Nuke Duck and mm-hmm. uh, you know a bunch of these players. How do you feel about those ones? Uh, I think you know they're probably the most qualified to do the job we're talking about. Mm. I just think it's a really hard thing to do. You know, anyone good enough to do it should probably just be playing themselves. Yeah. And with league, the other thing where I feel like the um, like traditional sports model felt falls apart is because league is such a rapidly changing game right you can look back in football or basketball whatnot go back 50 years and you know yeah i I get that the rules will change slightly but it's still pretty much the same game whereas with league if you go back 10 years where you're not playing the same game like there it changes so frequently compared to anything else so even if you're a really good player and you become a coach you have to still play some ungodly amount to maintain that form and uh, i think it's going to fall off at some point to to me though that's where like like i don't agree that for you to be a good coach you have to be amazing at the game right like when you look at like i know sports to to video games is not a one-to-one and there's differences but a lot of the the greatest sports coaches of all time never actually played right like at a pro level at all and aren't being like you know you don't have to be able to shoot the basketball in the hoop to know like how to do it so to speak Mm -hmm. right um and i do think that to to me like my vision of what a coach should be is not that the coach should be telling you exactly how the matchup should be going or knowing all the gameplay specifics they should have a greater vision of like what the team should be working towards as a goal right and i think that it's like a deep understanding of, of macro of how do they want to play the map of like what the general like team approach should be to the game like more of like a, a larger scale vision and then you your job as the coach in my mind is to help facilitate the discussions and help facilitate the players to like all get moving in, in the same way, right? I don't think that to me, like the head coach should be going and saying, ah, you know, I don't think you should combo in this way, Medio. So you should be doing that. It should be more, okay, we're going to be trying to play this like scaling game. So like you should be playing maybe more defensively to cover cover dives and do these sorts of things instead of actually, you know, like to me, that's more where I see a, a coach in League of Legends. And I don't think that you have to be a pro level player to be able to do that. Like I mm-hmm. think that when you look at coaching across so many different things, there's so many examples of people who are not good players, but can be really, really good coaches. Like Zixi, said it was a really good coach and I know a lot of people that I talked to thought he was really amazing even other coaches I remember when Parth was winning coach of the year on TSM Parth told me that he thought Zix was actually the best coach in the league by far um and Zix was not like a super high level player I don't think at any point right so I don't think that you have to be able to like physically do it to be able to help teach it I just think you have to know where the strengths and the weaknesses are and it's okay to depend on players for micro knowledge and these sorts of things in a game right like I think it's just if you're overstepping your bounds and trying to teach something that you are not the expert in or you don't know then I think that's where you're getting yourself in trouble right and I I agree with most of what you're saying I would say I guess my, my question would be, say you're a player and you have a coach who thinks they know what they're talking about. They are so confident that they know uh, these concepts they're talking about. But, you know, as a player who's played competitively for years, you know they're just wrong. They are dead wrong. What do you do? Then your team, your team failed in hiring a coach, right? I'm not saying that there can't be bad coaches or anything. And I think that's tough. It's just like... Like building building a team is obviously a, a huge component of, of a team being successful. Like the players you choose, the support staff you choose, everything goes into to being a successful team. So it's like as far as what do you do? I mean, that's that's a little bit of a tough question because I think the real answer is probably like the players, if they're all in agreement, and all feel this way, probably need to go to the GM and hopefully the GM gets you a new coach or gets you you know make some sort of change. It, but it, it, like that's where it also becomes hard because what if all the players don't agree either? Well, then, so, then there's not clearly one one right answer, right? Because it's like, that that's the other thing with League and with, with a lot of these games is you can talk to five different pros who are all at super high level and they'll all have very different opinions, right? Even with like basic things like matchups, like all all message players when a new ma- champion becomes meta and, you know, it's like, oh, who do you think wins this matchup or how do you think this matchup is supposed to go? And the three best players in the league in that role can all tell me wildly different things, yeah. right? Yeah. And so it's like, that's why I think that just because you don't agree with a coach doesn't mean that they like aren't knowledgeable necessarily or whatever you know i i i I definitely agree with that um i think the biggest sort of team shock i had was when i joined optic you know um i worked with zabutin there and like i like zabutin i think he's like a good dude i think that he didn't have like 
a background in coaching for very long. So there were some things when I came into the team that like, you know, we had to work through. And and one of the weirdest ones for me on that team is like, cause Optic was an org where like the players on the team, they didn't really have a lot of success uh, beforehand. So I thought like, you know, coming into the team, I'm like, this is going to be like a really cool project for me. I can like help teach these guys, like share all my knowledge and stuff. Uh, I was met with a lot of resistance though. Like I had people who, you know, never really won anything like adamantly telling me how to jungle and whatnot. And, and there would be games where uh, in every bottom lane matchup, we were like down 50 CS, losing our turret before plates fell off. And and then in review, I'm just getting told, yo, we got to play bot side here. Like we didn't have enough jungle pressure. And then like, what do you do as a player? For me, that was like the biggest shock. I'm like, I don't know what to say here. Like this is, yeah. this is absurd. I mean, that just sounds like a failed system, right? Like, but I don't think that inherently means that like coaches cannot be useful or that's uh, that kind of Yeah, thing. yeah. I mean, that, I mean, right? Like, yeah. Like there can be a horrible instance of something, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's. I, I, I think that the problem is that the horrible instance is the norm in, in, Le yeah. in League of Legends. Um, because I, I, I like the ideal scenario, you know, where it, it should be possible for this, but I also have a same similar thing where it's, it's really hard to trust someone's opinion on the game when they can't get to a reasonable level. And then you're faced with a coach that's like, how does this coach prove that they do have, that their knowledge is, is correct or that they do have good ideas? It has to be an overtime be thing, building trust, right? Yeah. Cause, and it, that's extremely hard. Yep. And in all my years, being a player and talking to players in League of Legends, it is so rare for players to ever say, I liked this coach or this coach actually did something positive. Zix is one, Jungle Juice is another one. Um, it's That's why when whenever there is a player that says, oh yeah, this coach actually has some League of Legends knowledge and actually helped us in some way, um, is, is super meaningful when you have players actually vouching for a coach. And it has been so rare in League, I guess because a combination of League changing so much and having so many confounding factors where the decision trees in a game of League of Legends just sprout like crazy. Um, sorry, I hit my mic right there. I know that's it. <laughs> that has been an issue, but um, I, yeah, it is, it's a really difficult thing to tackle because in, a, in this game, you have to trust so much. Everybody has these really strong opinions yeah. about the game and like how something is supposed to turn out. And with, with them constantly changing the values of objectives and like, Maybe how we should split push here or we should not split push here changes. And, you know, someone thinks they can win a base race by a second or doesn't, um, you know, fluctuates as well. And so these yeah. uh, these things are super hard. And that, when you're talking about, oh, well, you know, it, it, it takes time. Then over time, you kind of have to prove these things. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. You don't uh, have a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. The I, I like what you said there because going off the point of like, you know, what what if you take the rank one – solo queue player like the best guy you can find mm. from last season and you make him the coach of some team right so you like obviously this guy's good at the game uh but you come into this season and you ask him how much priority do we put on grubs what build should i be doing now like those things changed infinitely from last season to this season so like nobody's really going to know the answer right away mm -hmm. so i think that's where it's hard in league to that's have like someone outside of the actual players playing be the driving force. I do, do I do think it is so helpful because time is such a constraint. Yeah. And I think that this is one of the main issues as well is time is an insane constraint for this game that has so much uh requires so much knowledge and changes so much. What what is so useful is this like analyst position where you have someone watching LCK, LPL, you know, the the best leagues and they can bring to your players a specific VOD of a specific thing that one of these extremely successful teams already use. And then they can teach you something. That's that's where I've always felt like I've seen the, the best coaches or best analysts um, really impress players and mm -hmm. actually help players. The vision thing is a good example, um, but I, I've seen it a whole bunch too. I know one player was talking to me about uh, a coach brought them something that th completely revolutionized how they thought about a specific matchup and and uh, about trading in the matchup. Um, so those types of things where you have someone focusing time and basically they distill knowledge of a bunch of time that they spent getting this VOD and, and being able to review this or whatever to teach you one specific thing in a smaller amount of time. I think that is a very valuable mm -hmm. 
um, position. And that's why I kind of wanted separation between those types of teaching positions on the game and an author authority position, I guess, just to socially make sure your team can operate and, yeah. and move past arguments and stuff. It is w one thing. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, like, it is interesting because it's like, I'm, I'm not going to say, I mean, I, I I haven't played pro league on these teams. So I haven't had these coaches, so I can't really speak to, you know, how good either coaches were or weren't. And all my pro gaming background, we had no coach. We just figured everything out ourselves, right? It's obviously a very different thing. And when I spent all the time in StarCraft House, there was, again, no coach. Players just figured everything out. So it's very different. Um, but I will say that it's like, I can see how coaching can be really useful. I can also see how in a lot of cases it isn't useful currently. Um, but I think a lot of that is also just the reality is like esports coaching is still kind of in its infancy, right? When you, t when you talk about tr uh, traditional sports and the comparison, one of the biggest things I think that there isn't really in current pro gaming now is like a pipeline to where you, where you become like you go up and you're getting experience. It's like, okay, I coached in high school and then I got, I was really good there. And then I learned there and then now I'm coaching in university and I became, you know, good, excuse me. Uh, yeah. I became good in university. And so now I get an opportunity as like an assistant coach in the NBA and I'm learning the ropes. And then now I have like my own philosophies and I, I know what I can do. And now I'm a head coach or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like people have probably coached for 20 or 25 years before they're like an NBA coach or an NFL coach. Whereas in, in league and esports in general, it's kind of like, oh, this guy knows the game well, or oh, he's an ex-pro or oh, he's a whatever. Okay, you're a coach now, you know? And it's like, doesn't, just because even if you have the game knowledge or you don't, you don't necessarily like, you're not necessarily suited to the job, right? And I think that that's one thing that esports lacks. And I think that in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever, I would expect to see if games do last a really, really long time, if they stay around, that that pipeline is more built out and you're going to see more people who are coaching in the LCS who've been coaching for a long time prior to that. Right. And uh, I mean, to push back on that a little bit, I think that, because that's definitely like a, an idea I've heard before. And I think that is just kind of where the, the parallel to me falls apart between league and uh, traditional sports, because like I said, the game changes so much. And even just the level you're playing at, you know, if you are the coach of the best collegiate team and then you go to coach LCS, I, I doubt that's even going to help very much outside of having good people skills because the game's going to be played so much different. People understand the game differently. And then say you're a coach that goes internationally or whatever, like your your team makes to MSI Worlds, uh, the game just changes so drastically as you go up in the different skill levels and brackets so that any knowledge you've accumulated in these like, I guess, weaker regions or, or leagues isn't actually that helpful in my opinion. I, I disagree because I think again, to me, it's like, I don't see the coach as, as the person who's teaching all the individual like, like player skill type stuff. It's, it's more about like knowing, knowing how to teach the game, knowing like, you know, setting directions for the team and stuff like that. And I think that can still apply. And I also think that if someone's really good at one thing, they can hopefully like adjust and use that knowledge to to adapt to the new scene that they're in. And also, I mean, the collegiate example is a little bit funny to me because it's like Maryland University. They have the OQs right now. They were literally tied for first with with the NACL teams, right? Um, so clearly, like there can be, I think, carryover. And I think just just like how it's it's almost like saying that you know like someone who's like top level in academy as a player like couldn't possibly contribute in LCS. Well, there's stuff that you have to learn, but it doesn't mean that you can't you know adapt and bring those skills to a new environment. Yeah, I get that. Um, it, it's it's pretty much just always for me comes back to the idea that like, honestly, for me, I think a team could honestly do really well or even better than some other teams if they just went in only the five players, no coach, no analyst, nothing, just the five players figuring it out together and going from there. Because in my experience, I felt like that worked the best. Um, one thing that I actually think would be cool for teams to try is getting more temporary coaches in a way, like rather than having a coach for the entire split, I think in my experience, the coaches have been the most effective in the very beginning when, when the team is first starting out, like when you first hear their ideas, cause they're coming to you with new stuff you probably haven't heard yet. So I think if it's like, you know, say a team's struggling, they're like, all right, let's just hire double lift for a week. Like he's just going to come in here and help us for, for one week. And it's like, you're not attached to this guy. He's not your coach, but he's just going to give you different perspective and maybe shake things up. I think that kind of thing would be more valuable for a team. I think one of the most like pretty famous examples is from the, just this last year, Zayus got, they called it help from Khan. 
uh, who is another one of these amazing top laners. But that is that is kind of this like positional coach uh, mm-hmm. more so- sort of term. But I just think like that thing is so useful and it's very similar to what you're saying. Like if you're going to on a small time frame, hire someone to come give you, you know, what what's their condensed packet of knowledge that they're trying to give you. Um, there's no reason that a like Zeus Khan relationship can't also be someone who's, you know, specifically working on early game or specifically working on, you know, macro or something, something like that. It's just that I guess you would have to prove it first. So the con example is, is super easy. Cause you're like, yep, I trust him. I, uh, you know, he's because that- he's done it. He, exactly. he, he has proven to be yeah. one of the best top laters. It's not, you know, he's not the guy on Reddit who's saying I've watched all these VODs. I've yeah. analyzed so many games. I'm, I'm silver three, but yeah. I've watched a lot of challenger games because if you can't do it, how do you really understand yeah. it? That, that's what I always say. I'm like, I never like to make, like ask people on my teams to do something that I couldn't do. And that's where like some of the coaching stuff will rub me the wrong way. Cause honestly, in almost every team I played on, when the coach would watch our games, they would do it with both teams, like with fog of war off the way you'd watch a competitive match. And I would always say to them, I'm like, how, how do you learn anything doing this? Because in my mind, you have to only watch with your team's vision because you know, as nice as it would be, we're not map hacking in the game. Uh, we, we only <laughs> have this info. And like, how do you even get the feeling of the value of wards or feel the pressure from their jungler if you see where he is the whole time? And most coaches that I, I brought that up to, they're like, yeah, actually, that makes sense. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start watching it that way. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I think more power to the players is, is always the way I would go. It's interesting. It's definitely interesting. I mean, I, I could see the five player, no coach thing working really well if everyone gets along really well like old school esports you just played with who you wanted to play with and there wasn't all this other stuff and so i could it it worked well for my team but it was also if i didn't like playing with a player anymore i got another player (laughs) you know what i mean yeah no but that's how i feel like it should be like you're the team captain of your team you choose the people you want to play with and if you're good you probably have people lining up to play with you right yeah look at t1 how often do you think the coach is telling faker what to do like They've had, I mean, they had coma for a while, but they've had a bunch of different coaches, but it's always Faker. And as soon as he doesn't like his teammates, he's probably getting new teammates. And I guarantee you, those players are not fighting Faker on anything. They're just going with him. And like, obviously that's like- Faker's the the, most extreme. Yeah, yeah, obviously it's it's kind of an outlier, but I think for for showcasing the point, it kind of works in the sense that like, in, in my mind, a team would just be like kind of built around a player, you know, like it's this guy's team. And then he gets his boys- they follow him if they, if they are beefing too hard the guy just leaves and they get yeah. someone else but we do know that there's also insane amounts of player drama and arguments yeah. and all that kind of stuff which can That's part be, of it which can be really hard to deal with it is a, it is a really interesting conversation yeah. should we do you want to do you want to finish it up or okay uh, it's a really interesting conversation obviously you know not everyone has to agree, um, but it's it's fun to talk about, and it'll be interesting yeah. to see what the development is of it over these next couple of years. And also, maybe if we get some chance to see your uh, your plan in action, just the the no coach team, yeah, do it uh, could work out. Um, we got a ton of questions from uh, from me tweeting out, you know, that we're going to do this kind of community focused episode. Obviously, it's a bit of a a weird episode because it's been a couple of weeks since we had games, so I figured it's a good time to talk about some of these kind of bigger topics like coaching and also to answer some of your guys' questions and some of your hot takes. So we got, I don't know, 150 or something responses. We got a bunch of questions, and we're going to start with some of them here. The first one's going to come from Jordan, Lo-Fi Banshee. He says, "If you could bring back a specific iteration of a champion, which would it be? And then question number two is favorite thing about new season, whether LCS specific or in the game in general. I got a good one for that. My favorite pre rework is actually Urgot. I would bring back Urgot. Little missiles to see. Yeah, right, so okay, okay. Position reversing thing where you'd like into your position with. Yeah, the yeah. Other but I mean, okay. So he was fairly simple. <laughs> he he was never super popular. He was played like eighty carries sometimes. Sometimes he show up top lane. But here's my thing. I think people didn't play him because he was too ugly. But the (laughs) the actual play style of the character was cool. I think if you replace that Urgot, put in like the model of like some hot sorceress babe who's like (laughs) shooting fireballs instead of like this abomination shooting acid hunters or whatever they're called, people would play the hell out of it. It was actually a fun here. It was like 
you know, had a, like a, an Ezreal Q could uh, lock on. Like I thought that that was fun. One thing I thought that was not fun was playing against it because back then I played a lot of lane also, and mm-hmm. laning against an Urgot, if he landed the heat seeking goopy shit, then he would just spam you with with the yeah, dodge it, <laughs> dodge yeah, it. Just don't get hit with the with the with the uh, initial pheromones or whatever That's a skill the, issue. the hell it was. Yeah, the acid, but. The the pheromones. range the range on the on the follow up the heat seeking yeah it was strong. I believe it was Q's with after yeah that, yeah Q's. was insanely long yeah it's wrong hit they had to turbo nerf it uh to 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 keep him I, I'm just saying that was cooler yeah. than current Urgot yeah. this current Urgot I don't know you he, don't like those shotgun legs he, I mean it's like okay but I don't know he's like this weird kind of like mid game he's like not that good early or late and he like spikes really hard at 13 on like two items or something I, I don't know he never really like has found his place in the mm-hmm. game in my mind yeah um I, for me I actually really liked the old Swain I like the laser bird mm-hmm. and because I always thought like I, I was I've always liked playing you know kind of like drain tanky sort of style and I liked that with Swain, it's like you could toggle the ultimate on and off. Um, it actually felt like a dot champion, right? Like with the laser bird kind of like denying people off minions. The E was a dot. So it felt like you were all kind of like dots and draining and whatnot. And I always kind of liked that play style. New Swain never really hit that mark in the same way for me because it, especially, I mean, I, I guess it's been changed a few times, but especially when it first came out, it felt much more kind of like suicide bomber where you have to charge up your alt and then like you had to get these soul shards that made it do more damage and you jump in the back and explode and then you kind of just die because you stop draining. Mm -hmm. now you can like pop your alt while still draining so it has a little bit more of that kind of sustain thing but i've never really liked the laser hands thing it it is weird the w always felt like it really had very little purpose um it's like i think initially when they were designing it i think it was supposed to be more like a scouting thing and i think the designer who was designing it got let go and then someone else took over halfway but the kit was like already locked so they were kind of stuck with that Mm -hmm. but it's like what is the W? The W is literally just a thing that you drop down when you hit E to get another soul shard. Like that's realistically, that's it. It's just mm-hmm. a dead ability. Like there's nothing interesting about it. You can sometimes interrupt a recall with it. Otherwise in a team fight, you just like plop down the W on someone and hope they don't step out of it. Like it is such a useless ability. Yeah. Um, and I feel like he lost a lot of his identity, honestly, with the rework. Uh, whereas the old one to me, at least was a lot of fun. To me, I like almost... I like the majority of the reworks. Uh, there's two old champions. GP1 is amazing. One of the best reworks, I think. <laughs> the, the, uh, the GP1, I think the Aatrox is the best. Cyan rework is also really good. Atro- New Aatrox is insanely fun. Actually, they turn, like, it's kind of fighting game-ish. You know, you have your, your Q combos and stuff. Um, I played a lot of the old Aatrox, the attack speed one yeah, champ felt so that bad. would have that would have a yeah you like you would have to go fight to your death so you could you could use your uh revive yeah. uh mechanic and I, like it was kind of fun i wouldn't say i would want him back over new atrox though new atrox is so cool um i guess maybe old aurelian soul that was actually roaming and not scaling uh just because i have so many fond memories of who he mm-hmm. and and clg at international events you know versus rocks tigers um at msi as well uh so maybe i would go with the aurelian soul one but yeah a lot of the reworks have been super good i mean old volley bear we chucked you over his shoulder was funnier did you did you guys like old graves i used to play a lot of old graves bot lane with leona where you just like dash dash in on them and the the triple buckshot graves is definitely one of the ones that you hear come up pretty often where people talk about him fondly but like I don't know. I, I actually played AD carry back then. I was an AD carry main in like season the BT one and two. Rush days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was the there was the trifecta. It was like Ezreal, Corky, Graves were the three ADs you play bot. And I never really liked Graves. He was pretty short range. I think he was like four fifty or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was good with like Taric or like you said, Leona, yep. someone who can CC and then he just QRs you and kills you. But like he wasn't actually that cool. I think the new Graves is infinitely cooler. Like he's got a shotgun and like I hate smoke screen. I mean, don't get me wrong. I ban him a lot. Like, I, I don't like playing against him, but I think just, like, as a character, it's way more interesting than the old one. That's fair. Uh, what's the favorite thing about new season, uh, or a specific, or game in general? Favorite thing about new season? I actually really like the Grubs. I think the Grubs, grubs were really successful. I think uh, there's a lot of interesting kind of mini games around that. I've, start, I've been playing a, a fair bit of Kindred, and I've just been doing a lot on, like, 
especially if you're playing red side where you just hop over, take one grub and then just leave and stuff. You just try to do that twice. So they can't get, you know, enough grubs to actually spawn the void mites, things like that. It's, it's fun. It gives them good experience It's an extra objective. So it feels like there's something interesting to play around on that side of the map early. So how do you guys feel about the change that they made to the aggro of the grubs? Because I feel like, I don't know when they exactly implemented this, but I feel like it's right after the LCS game where we had one at, at Whippo's Tower. <laughs> it was. It, I was it, laughing so hard. It's literally the next patch because they, they we had a grub that was at Whippo's Tower, and the way that happened is if one of the grubs, like they shared aggro, so if one of them was still aggroed inside their range, which it was, Blabber was doing one inside the pit, then the other ones will stay aggroed on whatever they are. They could yeah. be aggroed on different things, but as long as one was still inside, they would they would stay in there. Now though, they split it up. I'm pretty sure they did it right after that game, but now it's split up. So you can have some of them walking back uh, and you know, then they never go super, super long range, but it is kind of annoying when I, I it, someone else gets aggro and then I can't keep them all together and I want to AOE them. Yeah, grubs, the aggro never makes sense to me before or after the change. Like there, there was that example. I remember I had one game where I just, I walked over to the grubs. There was only two in the pit and I'm like, I don't know when he took it. I, I, I guess he did. I killed both of them. And then like 10 seconds later, the third one just comes waddling in from, I don't know where, like, I don't know where it went. So, um... Yeah, it's it's weird. When, but when yeah, they, I, I do normal. love the idea of the objective. And I, as we've said many times, mm -hmm. I, I feel like it's one of the smartest new implementations where it's a different type of objective. Three of them, multiple smites. You mentioned last time, yeah, both junglers can get their bonus experience from their jungle item off the first one that they kill. So there's, you know, games around trying to get just the one or or, or you can do one over the wall actually with jungle, jungle Ezreal is super popular again now. Well, I say super, but it started. Seen it. I've it's, never seen it either. <laughs> it started, it's starting to get popular yeah. again. Uh, I was talking to Inspired about it. Inspired was uh, playing a bunch of the of games with it. Um, you can go the lethality build. Obviously, you don't need mana in uh, a lot of the range ones in can jungle. Do it. But yeah, regardless, or, I I, I think that's one of the coolest that. changes of the new season. Yeah. Um, as as far as LCS specific, the top two is full audiences once again and being on the live patch. Uh, and I don't think either of those need explanation. All right, let's hop to the next question here. This one's from Michael Dixon. If you had to pick one thing, what do you think is the most important factor of the LCS that would help contribute to international success? Hmm. I don't, I don't know if this is really answering the way he wants to answer, but to me, by far, the most important thing to having international success is just high level of competition here because I really believe that the players are talented enough that it's not like they are just inherently worse. It's that LCK, LPL, they have high, more good players, more good teams, and it's like steel sharpens steel kind of thing or whatever, you know, where it's, if you're playing against better players, they show you holes in your game, you improve, you overcome them, and it kind of becomes this like thing where you're pushing each other forward. Um, so to me, the most important thing by far is just you want as many good players as possible in the league that are pushing each other and, and improving the teams. Yeah, um, that, that definitely would work. I think uh, maybe playing more games could help. I think... Uh, we have a later question. Stage we'll, games? We'll talk about it. Yeah, stage games. I think, uh, you know, if you look at LCS compared to LPL or LCK, they play way fewer games, especially this split. Um, I would just like more games. It's, it's fun to watch. And I think that as much as you try to get good reads from scrims, stage games are always going to be more important because there's actually stakes behind them. The teams are absolutely playing to win like there, there's a reason they don't want to lose whereas in scrims sometimes like uh people will just flip things for no reason and you might get bad reads yeah i see it's super common now for all the teams to have it as one of their big bullet points flyquest recently they like they posted a picture of their whiteboard where they had it cloud nine has uh talked about it but all of the teams now seemingly have as one of their goals or important rules is take scrims as seriously as stage games but no matter how you try and pound that into your players or how, how much they're focused on it, it's actually just going to be different without yeah. you know crowd and, and being you know, at home or at the office or whatever rather than on the stage. Uh, and it is kind of hard to get in the exact same mentality. Yeah. Um, what would you say then to, you know, because I've, I've heard this, you know, this, this kind of take, but I've also seen the other side, whereas when we did, we had um, double best round, uh, double round Robin, best of three you were probably in the league at the time when we did the double stream thing and lcs didn't do better internationally in that year do you think it was just that they needed more years of that or like why do you think that it, that didn't correlate to better international success well 
so for starters, I think it's very hard for LCS to win internationally. And that's not even saying the league is bad or whatnot. But when you just look at uh, China or Korea, it would not make sense for them to lose to us, right? Like, it, I think the biggest factors is going to be, like, player base. China probably and, has more than 50 times the players. Yeah, I mean, China has an unreal amount of players. And Korea, they have a ton of players. But also, like, uh, just the, the ping in solo queue matters so much, right? Like, the fact that in if you're a pro player in LCS, you are forced to solo queue on, on 50 to 60 ping. Which, like, people will call it a cope excuse, but but realistically, if you're putting in the same inputs on 60 ping, it will not get you the same results as doing it on zero ping. So, obviously, that's that's going to be a huge deal. So, if I was LCK and I was losing to a team that had like you know a way smaller ranked player base, uh, way worse practice conditions, I I don't think that would make any sense. So I I think it, even like if you say you know obviously. LCS has been losing internationally, so everything we're doing is wrong. Uh, I feel like that doesn't totally work because, like, you're probably just going to lose no matter what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that more stage games w would probably help. Cool. Yeah, I always, I always just felt like it, also the the age at which people start playing, you know, and whether they're playing normal games or ranked games is very different too. North America has the highest percentage of normal game players compared to ranked game players of all the regions, which is kind of interesting. So we just need to have every child get a computer at a young age and start practicing and playing in ranked and training up. And then... Yeah, Korea doesn't even have normal draft. We'll just have legions really? yeah. of players. <laughs> interesting. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it's they don't even have normal draft because the mode was so unpopular. So I, I, I think this, I, it's one of the normal modes. I'm pretty sure draft is disabled. There's only like blind pick, normals, or ranked. Mm -hmm. So if you want to play like draft, I'm pretty sure you can only play ranked That's, because it was so much more popular. I'm almost 100% sure it was that. I literally played a bunch when we were in Korea for uh, this last year, yep. but I can't, I can't even say which one wasn't there because I only played so like you yeah, ranked also. Yeah, because you don't play normals. <laughs> there you go. I can't even say. <laughs> I can't relate. All right, uh, next question here. This one comes from SMT Enjoyer. Uh, I was wondering how you three feel about the two-week break and how it'll impact each team. Which do you hope, uh, what do you hope each team worked on? Also, some insight onto, oh, this cuts cuts off. Um, but maybe just like for one team or something, what's some, a team you, know, you think I would mean, help and what you hope they work on? And we talked about this in the previous episode or the first episode that went going into the dark weeks where we're like well energy and cloud nine pff, biggest spotlight is for sure on them because they are expected to be number one number two and they are not even close to number one number two so uh, that is still where my head is at i'm like holy they have better done some intense practicing over these last couple of weeks and come out you know with some big improvements and firing because we only have this week and then the super week and then we're in playoffs so Practice time is over, all right? We got to, uh, or almost over, so they got to get ready for playoffs. In my experience, these breaks um, help reset momentum in a way. I, so I actually, you know, not saying this is going to happen, but I would expect from what I've seen before, it, it hurts the teams that are doing well, and it's going to help the teams that were struggling before the break. Yeah. I, I think I did mention it in the previous episode, but, like, you know, if, if you're winning, you just, you don't have that same motivation. Like, you might just... Yeah, you're more, getting lazy. Oh, yeah, like <laughs> just a little bit. Obviously, you know, they're not trying to. No one's trying to do this. Yeah. But uh, you don't have that like, you know, the the pain from losing to, <laughs> to, to fire you. Like you're not trying to be like, we can't let this happen again. You're just like, uh, we're fine. Like, let's just play some quirky support. Like, whatever, man. Like, it's, it's fine. <laughs> I know a lot of people are thinking 100 Thieves could really be screwed with this because the rumors are, well, everyone's saying it. 100 Thieves are horrible in scrims, including 100 Thieves themselves. Ayla said that they were on a 17 loss streak in scrims. They lost 17 straight games. But they're still doing well on stage. So people are like, oh, well, they're going to lose their momentum. Other teams are going to, you know, pass them. So we'll see how it all does work out. Uh, next question here. This one's from Chris Tidwell. It says, uh, do you have any speculation on roster changes before it? Next split. Who picks up Licorice, perhaps? For me, like, I feel like Licorice absolutely should be in the, in the league. I think he was the best top laner in the league last year. Um, and I think, you know, while it's, it's hard, you know, to be talking about, ah, like partway through a split or anything like that, you know, should be replacing people. But... The reality is I do think like a roster swap, especially a, a one with, with a really good player like that you're picking up, can give you a little bit of that kind of reset and like mental. So if a team is doing really poorly, you can sometimes get that honeymoon phase, maybe have a new chance to kind of fix some problems. So I do think, honestly, 
any of the teams that are down at the bottom, if you're, if you're missing playoffs for sure, like you should be probably mm -hmm. considering it at the very least. Yeah, I know Licorice is working on some other projects. You know, he talked about uh, his like mindset coaching project as well. So I think he definitely is a very strong candidate for a midseason replacement. I don't know if it will actually happen. What about I know Spica? he said he was open to it still. What about what? Speaker? Or Spica, anyone else? Yeah, Speaker's been grinding away. I watch his uh, Solicue stream. Rank one challenger, sides. right? Yep. He hit rank one again. Yeah, I, I think either of them would be a good addition to teams. I, I generally side with not making changes in teams unless there's something that's just completely not working. Um, you know, if it feels like your team is, like, even if you're not doing great, if you're getting better, if everyone's yeah. on the same page, I would prefer to keep that team together, at least, like, for the full year rather than a mid-split replacement. But if you have just a terrible environment, people cannot get along, they're, like – you know, just morale is terrible, then um, yeah, probably may need to make a change. That makes sense. All right. Next one here from Jorge uh, Villatoro says, now that we're more than halfway done this spring split, who do you think will win MVP, rookie split, coach split, comeback player, et cetera. So kind of just uh, who's your early award candidates. It is rookie of the year. Uh, I've seen a lot of people online saying, oh yes, like sniper these last couple games, he's going to win rookie split for sure. It's rookie of the year. There's not a rookie of the split. So that won't actually be done until the end of the year, but we can kind of talk about, um, maybe some of the players that are standing out to you guys for yeah. uh, for And awards. we can say, because this is just the dive and they asked the question, who do you think would win rookie of the split? Sniper. If we, if we yeah, uh, Sniper's, he, he's been impressive. In the beginning, I was I was a little hesitant because, you know, there's so much hype. Uh, and, you know, his first Riven game wasn't great, but he's had a lot of really good games since then. I think he shows a lot of promise, especially for not playing so long. So mm -hmm. definitely would give my vote. Yeah, I think... Um, Masu, you know, honorable mention. Uh, Meech, honorable mention as well. I wish that Exu and Isles were technically considered rookies, but they are not because they both have a couple of games. Would you so, put either of them above Sniper, though? I, I wouldn't, good. but I would definitely put them in the honorable mentions. Yeah, like uh, it'd be especially, like three or whatever. Yeah, I think both of them have been good. How many rookies are there? Especially like, is, is there that many more than three? There's, a, I think there's five. There's okay. the... There, there's Masu, Meech, Sniper. Uh, I forgot who the other two were, but then a bunch of a bunch of the other ones are like young, but have played a couple of games, and so they're. So does Tomo count or not? I'm not actually sure if Tomo counts because I think he came up and played someone. Dignitas swapped their. Academy. Yeah, no, Tomo R. Yes. Tomo R. has already played. So he, he doesn't count. He already played a bunch with Dig. Um, I'm trying to think who else it would be. But uh, as far as MVP, that's pretty fun right now. I feel like inspired maybe would be my vote there's a lot you could say right now since we're still partially way through i think inspired probably would be the front runner for me he you know he, he we we know him to be the kind of like driving force on fly quest he's mm -hmm. he's setting up the plans he's always like such a solid jungler so if i had to choose right now i'd probably choose inspired i also think that river so i was gonna say second um he has just looked very good um especially on a team that no one expected to do well and a lot of their advantages are coming off of his plays like the decisions he makes in game the mechanical outplays he, he goes for are just really impressive so to me that that shows an extremely good player when you can make anybody look good with you especially when you're looking at a team that was expected to do so poorly and they're they're at like at the top of standings, right? Like they're doing very well. Um, not in scrims, but on stage they're doing well. And River, I think, has been a beast. So definitely uh, worth that consideration. They also asked about coach of the split, and we talked for 30 minutes on coaches so far. <laughs> Who's your coach? Coach of the How split? How would you know, man? Yeah. We don't know what the coach is. I don't vote doing. on coach of the split because yeah. of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like whether a coach is good or bad, like the, you, we will never know. No one except the yeah. team knows. Yeah, we need more data on that one. Yeah, all right. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, next one here comes from, uh, oh, also, uh, Andrew Barton. We won't go to this later because we're kind of talking about it now. He also tweeted, basically, his take was inspired MVP. You guys kind of agreeing so mm -hmm. far. Uh, GM for FlyQuest over there, so he wanted to get that out there. Uh, Road Roller, though, he tweets, would you like to see Fearless Draft in a best of two for the LCS? So Fearless Draft, if you guys don't know, if you're listening at home, is where you basically cannot repeat the same picks. So, you know, if you play Zach in game one, doesn't have to be banned in game two. You just cannot go back to it. So it's forcing some more champion diversity into mm -hmm. it. I would because I care purely about entertainment. And so 100% I would. 
Obviously, that's a different format and wouldn't prepare us for international events. Ship it. So, <laughs> yeah, man, it's like fun it, to watch. So, boo. At the end of the day, people watch Pro League for entertainment. Yep. Yeah. It should be entertaining. I would love any kind of format that changes up how you pick and anything that forces people to play something that, you know, as viewers, you don't see often, or even as a player, like you maybe wouldn't be able to prepare it as much. So I, I think that would be awesome. I would love that. How about you can't pick anything that was picked in LCK last night? <laughs> <laughs> Sold. Uh, here, here's here's my take, and I don't know if this is a hot take or not, but I also think, and I've felt this way for a long time, that okay, there's the S tier, there's like the meta picks that are just our defaults that everyone goes to, but I really believe that there's a very big kind of A tier below that of champions, which can situationally be you know sometimes even better, or you know, or maybe just slightly worse. Worse, but there's a lot of situations where those champions I think are overlooked because people default so heavily to the meta. And I actually think that as much as people are like, ah, well, if we did fearless, it'd screw us over internationally. I don't really agree with that because I think you know it forces you to actually explore some of these other champions, which are then available and maybe become actually some of those primary picks for you in certain spots. Yeah, I, th I mean, even outside of fearless, I think a big thing that drives the meta is just the the draft format being so counter pick heavy right because a big reason that you see the same champion something like Cassante Udir maybe is because like you have to blind pick something on your team right not everybody gets counter pick and you don't want to blind something that's going to get completely hammered in lane so you default to these like more safe more solid champions like I don't think anything really hard counters Cassante um and so you just see him more often I don't know what you would do to change the format I think there's like a ton of things you could do probably but I think yeah, if you weren't so worried about getting counterpicked all the time, you'd see a lot more champs. All right, uh, next question here. So we're gonna have to do a time limit on this one because this one we could get really in the weeds, but we'll we'll do rapid fire. What would be your LCS dream team? There's a two import limit. It's their peak skill, and green card is optional. I'm gonna I'm gonna say so. I want double lift and Afro move back. I so want that bottom lane. Are we counting green cards or not? Like, are those counting as imports or not? Like, is Bjergsen an import? Is Jensen an import? I don't know. I think they're, they're fine to not. Be okay, so yeah. so so if you have, if you have a green card, you don't cast an import. Yeah. So I'm I'm just gonna rattle off probably off the top of my head. Um. Okay. So my my non imports, blabber double lift, um, maybe like licorice. Can I have? Can I have? Is is it perks? as is lec peak. Do I get perks? I. I is it why not? Nine tried to do that, bro. He they was don't, in the LCS. If they don't get, he was washed when he came to LCS. <laughs> yeah, if they don't, wasn't even that bad. I feel, like, I feel like he did fine. They, he did fine. Like, uh, but compared compared to his peak, you, you get peak yeah, I mean, of his LCS. No, play. I get peak of his LEC. Perks is giving me my mid laner. All right, well, actually, and then Core JJ support. That's world, what I was world champion say. core. Yeah, that's what I was gonna yeah, say. So we have that, a lot of people that are world champions at some. So point. that's 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 my uh, my five then. Yeah, li licorice, blabber, perks. No. Nope. In LEC. No. Nope. Nope. Uh, Double nope. lift and Core JJ. That's my five. Just off the top of my head. <laughs> Man, that's actually tough. I'd have to think about it. I mean, I, I would go Blabber for We're a jungle. I'd probably, we'll I'd probably go Impact top. No BDOs? Not drafting yourself? I mean, that's a little, that's a little egotistical <laughs> for my liking. Um, from, from your peak, though, you were best jungler in the league. I mean, it, it would be was pretty good. It would be You're not going to pick yourself? Unfair. If I <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pick, so. uh, I would take Sneaky AD carry. Uh, uh, impact top. Who's support? Double lift. <laughs> I don't think I'd take double lift. The double lift blitz crank? Yeah. yeah. I've, I've tried this one. Before. <laughs> it, it he played that so shit well. at World Season yeah, 1. Yeah, yeah. I don't know about mid or support. I, I don't have anything for that. It's, it's, there's too many to you must pick. sort through. Must pick. I guess Bjergsen for mid. Um, yeah. Support. Lemonation. Uh, <laughs> Lemon's not a bad choice. I, I feel, I feel like Irish. like peak Lust Boy when he first joined TSM oh, was, was really, good, really good. It's crazy to me. Nobody else wants Afro Moo. I want Afro Moo back for sure. Peak Afro Moo. Af peak, peak Afro is really good, but peak Core is also pretty damn good. Afro Afro Moo is the only time when everyone was following North America meta. I felt like when he, at MSI when he started playing the Sona uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would, I would like Afro. I play with him. I'd play with him again. Yeah, maybe I'll take Afro support. All right, there we go. What was your full team? I just did the bottom lane. I mean, I'll also grab Medias uh, and then mid lane. Uh, well, since you went Jen or you went Bjergsen, I'll go Jensen. Uh, top lane. I mean, is there anyone besides Impact for top lane? I was lane? wondering if anyone. Oh, I said like. Oh, Huni. Oh, oh yeah, Huni. Huni, MSI champion Huni. 
Okay. When he's laughing. He, even when Hooney nah, came bro, up, like, you're like garbage pick. Like no disrespect to Ho- Hooney, Hooney, but like, dude, I played against him and it, it was he he was just the biggest clown to scrim against, man. <laughs> like I don't know, dude. He just Hooney in scrims for sure was it. I yeah, like I have such a hard time taking it seriously because it would be like I would have to tell my team like guys. I literally can't go top anymore. Like we are just not getting real games. This guy is dying to any and everything. <laughs> I I played rank fives with Hooney, and I have we had a hundred percent win rate. I played like maybe it was, it was only like four games total or something. <laughs> but he played Callista top, and he bonded with me, and he was like, "Play whatever you want, buddy." And they just ganked top, and we won every single game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, dude, like don't get me wrong. He he's a good player. He's he's been successful. He's a solid pick. I just my personal experience is playing with yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I watched some Echo Fox scrims back in the day when Hooney was on Echo Fox, <laughs> he was trolling. That's not yeah. Peak Cooney. That was not... You said we get Peak. Yeah. That was not Peak. Yeah, well, I, I actually thought it was a good pick. I was like, damn, that, I mean, I missed out on that. All right, we got some hot takes now. This one comes from uh, Gavin... I'm not sure how to say that. Gavin Kwok Sung. Um, part of the reason LCS will fall short this year is because we simply aren't playing enough games. LEC didn't... Uh, teams that didn't make playoffs played nine games. LPL has played nine games and they're BO3. LCK played 10 BO3s. We have talent, but not the consistency. This is kind of what you were talking about earlier. So you, you would say you agree with that i i think that more games would for sure help i don't think that would ever hurt a team getting more games uh whether or not like that's the reason we're not going to win i just think it's very hard for us to win internationally so that like using that as the bar for like anything is is just kind of like gonna make everything look bad all right but we're gonna give this one a soft pass yeah there you go. I mean, it would help for sure. All right. This next one comes from uh, Molecule. He says, LC- LCS clears the LEC. Thoughts? Oh, yeah. We saw what Energy did to G2. Like, yeah. it's not close. Yeah. I mean, we saw what Immortals did to Energy. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, the whole, our whole league clears. I, I, mean, I think, go ahead. I was just going to say this last split of, of LEC. Um, I guess G2 would still be G2 G2 is still like all right you know we we still got our okay we'll give you we'll give you that G2 is good G2 is still very good but uh, I definitely think uh, our LCS is so competitive this year it feels like even all the way down to the bottom of the league and it doesn't seem like LEC as the whole league you know looking at some of these games you're like whoa yeah yeah the bottom's not competitive I I think I think you you take G2 out of it and you take whatever whatever team <laughs> LEC yeah. wants to kick out of it too. They can kick out FlatQuest or if they still think C9 is going to be the best. Yeah. They chop can them that. down to eight teams and then it's good. But we're chopping the top. Yeah, We're chopping the top <laughs> and then we're having a, a league battle yeah, okay. and we're going to smash those fools. Oh, yeah, that's They're going to get blasted. That's smart right yeah. there. Yeah, Just cut caps yeah. out. We clear them. It's yeah. easy. Uh, all right. Next one comes from uh, Thomas Kuzer. Uh, says, Hot Take, fly the most consistent team in the league and have the best chance to take on the title with their combination of rookie and veteran star power. Wouldn't say it's that hot because they're in first place. Yeah. I've got, <laughs> I've got a lemon uh, bet riding on this for both of you guys, yeah. right? You, you guys are looking for, uh, for Cloud9 making the, the big run in the last couple of weeks? They will. <laughs> we'll give this... Um, a lukewarm. It's actually that's just cold. It's, that's a cold it's take. It's a pretty reasonable take. I mean, yeah, it's not hot. They're their first place and they've been winning. Like uh, I don't know. They have won the most games. They have. It's consistently absolutely not gotten not a hot take, but that's I, it's, it's that's like uh, Travis, my roommate, who's like, oh man, it's seventy two degrees in here. It's really hot. We gotta turn on the AC. <laughs> 72 is what I turn the AC to when I'm hot. <laughs> that is, that really? is, 72 is like my cold temperature. <laughs> he, wow. he only likes it at Crazy. exactly like 70. And so if it's below that or above that, got to, oh. got to change it. 70 is too cold. It's crazy. 70 is too cold. 70 is good. All right. Uh, this one comes from a John Billabong Zudema, Zuidema. Uh, hot take LCS moving to live patch is the best format decision that's ever been made in NA and we should expect EU and wildcard regions to move there soon and eventually China and Korea too I, I not have, that hot I, I kind of yeah, yeah like I, I don't know if it's a hot take but I actually agree I think live patch is, is just better than not doing it I think it's fun to tune in and see okay what's OP on the new patch like what should I be playing you know like is this thing looking good? Am I going to get to see this new champion that just came out? Am I going to get to see this new item, this new build I heard about? Yeah. I think it's really cool. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's again one of those like not that hot, just kind of. I kind of well, I think that take. I also agree with the second part where he thinks that the other regions are going to move to that also yeah. and copy that pretty soon. I think that's also reasonable. How is that going to work for 
something like playoffs, though. Cause playoffs is locked. One patch. That, I don't know how you change that while keeping it fair, but it definitely has that issue of, like, I, I really don't care about games that are on old patches, especially if the game has changed drastically. Like, if, yeah. if they're doing something that isn't going to happen in my solo queue games, like, I just... Yeah, the only I problem is the teams it. are going to be like, this is so unfair. You you know, the beginning of playoffs, this team got eliminated, and then we changed the patch, and the patch is completely right, different. Right, right. I, I, don't I don't think it's something you can fix, yeah. I, I guess. So it just it is what it is. I guess for playoffs, it's not the worst thing, but if it's like a regular season game on an old patch, then I get really sleepy. I mean, I think, I think the only real fix to it would be that the live balance team would also have to be on board for it and do basically small patches only like once it's playoff time you like know? just keep buffing the stuff that like a certain team's winning with and like <laughs> nerfing the other team well it's like because when we get close to worlds and msi they're generally supposed to do okay it's smaller changes smaller changes as we get closer so it would have to be something like that with playoffs where it's like okay we're still in live patch but they're not putting out reworks and they're not putting out crazy things it's just like oh this good maximum Five change for the, one champion the champs. yeah, yeah. There you go. maximum change buff. allowed is two ad or armor that's it there you go all right, next one comes from Herrick. Says, hot take, Yon being antagonistic is actually really entertaining. And just saying, making him, uh, wait, and JS making him? Just saying. Just saying. Yeah, uh, making him a far more interesting and more fun player to follow and be a, a fan of. So I guess this is referring to pros. I don't know if you watched the pros episode, but he was kind of just like trash talking everyone, just stirring stuff up. So, uh, I mean, again, I agree. I don't think I don't think it's a hot take. People love trash talk. People love uh, when the players are showing personality. You know, when they're like not being neutral. They're like, no, this guy's ass, or that that team's garbage, or like you only won because because you got lucky. We'll smash you next time. That stuff's just more fun. It's also it's kind of like live patch where it's more relatable to solo queue, <laughs> where everyone's just tra <laughs> trash talking all the time. I don't know if I want the pros telling <laughs> telling everyone to get cancer and stuff, but uh, <laughs> that's more my solo queue experience. Yeah, uh, I mean I, I agree. I think like man the the Yon Zven arc from last oh, year was so good. I love that. Like just the no handshake, like death stare. That was so good. We we need more of that. It felt like we had like TMZ levels of, of tabloid pictures after yeah. two. They would be like zooming in, like look at his side glance on his eyes and look at the, the shoulder bump. That's something we didn't touch on in the in the free agent discussion. Do you guys think Sven guess, will guess spot? Dude, what is, I what's even so. the update on Sven? He's in Korea grinding. Okay. Yeah, he's he's living with LS. He's actually been streaming. I watch it. He streams kind of starting late for us mm -hmm. and then throughout the night so like usually right when i finish my stream he's on and i, I watch him uh it, dude he's just the funniest guy i really hope yeah. zven gets on a team he i think his he elevates whatever team he's on like as ad or support i think that he's one of the players who has a really good understanding of the game and i think he's Super very hard worker too mm -hmm. yeah he's a very hard worker i think he just um, helps his teammates too. I think that, you know, if, if I was on a team with him and I was doing some really troll thing, he would bring it up and address it and just like get to the bottom of it. I think yeah. he's one of those guys who's like not afraid to just ha have those hard talks, which honestly you need in a team. Yeah. Su super agree with that. I, I, there was one tweet. I don't even know if we actually put it into the document for the show, but I saw it and I'm going to say it anyways, make it the team, the best LCS team that you can with, uh, with players that don't have teams. I've got Zven, I've got Licorice. Spica. Uh, I've got Spica. Like, we we already have three positions here. We just need uh, and Licorice, Spica. support in uh, top lane. No, All right, I mean, support in mid lane. Mid lane. Yeah. Um, but who's who's a really good mid laner that's free agent, though? Poe Belter. Oh, I slammed Poe Belter in there. I want that on my... Uh, that's my team so far. And then support. And Zven just two boxes. He plays support and AD. <laughs> okay, genius. <laughs> what would you... I think I would want Zven on AD if I was picking Yeah, he, well, that's what he's practicing now, right? So. Well, he's doing both. Oh. He's, he's doing both. He Dude, said he would... Open. He so said the, he would prefer to be two AD. boxing is sounding kind of good. sounding kind of nice. Who's the, who's the best free agent support? Zven. If Zven's my AD therapy. <laughs> I, yeah. I feel... Zven also. Okay. <laughs> Does, Afro -moo. does it feel like recently all the best supports are role swap <laughs> supports too? Yeah. Yeah. Because how can you be good at the game if you only play support? It's, it's, I was going to say, it's, 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 I can see it in your it's eyes. It's fueling, it's fueling the conversation. I've seen so many of those tweets lately. I was just like, support is OP because all the yeah. support players are so garbage. And, yeah. Uh, okay, so there's a little bit of truth to it. Like, <laughs> yeah. like, I'm not even trying to shit on support players. 
if you only play support, you're just accidentally doing it. Yeah. Okay. So so it's just like the the required knowledge and skills that you can do well in support. At, it, it's just a lower bar than other roles. Like if I'm playing Yumi and Janna every game, like I'm not saying there's nothing you can do that's skillful, but if you like try to play any other role, you're just going to be missing so many other things. Like you know how to CS, how to lane, how to like team fight like go mm -hmm. in engage all this stuff like support can get by with very little of that yeah there's uh, there's two big factors in that and one is that just by the nature of the role you're gonna get free gold and that's the structure of it that's how you're going that's how it's going to operate and you get more free time you can you get to lane and you have roaming timings that you can go off as well so i just feel like with the structure of that role it's you know it's just kind of how it's set up all right, we have, there was a, a ton, an absolute ton of questions were about BO2, BO3. A couple of the people that tweeted about it were uh, Mr. Miniman, Joel Garrison, and Carter. So there was a bunch of people. Do you guys have a preference on if it's like BO2 or BO3? If you could decide, Mark Z gives you the keys to the LCS. You can choose format for summer right now. What is it going to be, Media? I talked to Mark Z about this, and I was hardcore pushing for... BO2. Does it change your mind? Because Flower says he's going to quit if we do BO2. That would be unfortunate. I think <laughs> I, I, I could probably talk him out of quitting. Okay, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's where I feel like everyone gets a bad taste in their mouth. I don't. I wouldn't call it BO2. I think that if you call it a BO2 and you do some weird point system, like you know, you get three points if you 2-0 them, uh -huh. I, I, I think that is where people get confused and it's just like, what am I looking at? I think... You just call it like a double header, a back to back. You just get more games this way because for for scheduling, it's a lot easier. You know, it's a bonus game. We're playing two connected best yeah, of you're, ones. You're you're because you play one blue, one red, and and I'm just okay with it. I know that there's like the sentiments like people hate ties, but I'm like, I don't think so, man. Like, <laughs> like it's not even a tie. It's just you played twice, and it's you know if Cloud Nine and FlyQuest are just going in twice and each one one game. It's back to back one. Uh, back yeah, to but like it's back to back not, sweeps. Yeah, and it, really. <laughs> It's just, <laughs> you go into playoffs, and it's like, okay, when these teams met in the regular season, they were pretty even. Yeah. Let's see what happens. One team I, I think slammed the other team 1-0, and then they got slammed 1-0. Yeah, I mean, but the thing is, like, you have a blue and a red side game, too, so, like, your your drafts are more even. I, I think it would be way better. I understand that the issues people have with it, but I, I just don't think they're that... The blue side, red side thing, I think, is the best argument for it, because it is the most for fair format, right? Um, where it's, like, every series that you have... Teams get to play once on each side, so draft is even. Like from that point of view, mm -hmm. I think I think it is the most fair. Um, but I do think that it's that it is. I I don't feel that those series are as satisfying, right? I if I'm seeing like a banger one one series, I'm like, well, I want to know kind of who wins. Yeah, I, gotta wait till next time they play. It leaves you hungry. But then there's another <laughs> best of two, and that's another. What if I don't want to <laughs> be hungry? <laughs> I, I don't. Sometimes wanna... I just want to eat food. Yeah. Sometimes you got to be hungry. <laughs> <laughs> gotta stay hungry. I personally just like tournament formats the most. So whatever is gonna get me a tournament format is what I'm gonna vote for. All right, uh, we got some other Twitter and YouTube questions. Uh, this one says, uh, this was from the Hyterian. If it doesn't get covered in this episode, I would like to know thoughts on unconventional supports like Camille beginning to shine. I'm mm. uh, personally a big fan of more variety for support mains. And if Riot is okay with this uh, and not going to gut them. Dude, if Freak can be killing it with Camille support, then we got to nerf it. <laughs> what does that mean? Why Why does Freak doing well Freak mean it has to be nerfed? a mechanical genius. <laughs> no. sort of like, oh, he is, he's flaming a, Freak no. now, I guess. He's a regular he's not here genius. Anymore. Regular genius. He's, he's a boring old genius. He's our good old buddy genius. Uh, no, yeah. Uh, I, I always do like it when there are, when unconventional things are used sparingly. I don't like it if they are the best at whatever they do, you know? I, I like things being able to be flexed into different roles is cool the issue you run into with it however is uh in, in pro play drafting because flex picks just naturally are better for draft because you know you can pick it early and then mm -hmm. oh this is a bad matchup i'm putting it somewhere else and then it, it makes draft kind of what i was mentioning earlier even more rigid in a way because it's like okay you know they're gonna pick a flex we're going to have to pick something that does well into this or does well into a counter pick. And so just like the conditions for like what champs you can pick when kind of get narrower. 
All right, this is kind of a, a question that I think is is off of what we were talking about with Freak last time. We were talking about kind of items in Dota 2 versus League and stuff. This says, what about Flash being turned into an item similar to Blink Dagger in Dota 2? It would open up the possibility of opting for Flash in the game instead of before it and even upgrading that item again. I don't like it. I don't want to pay for my Flash. I like my Flash. I've had my Flash my whole life. So you want it from you're, level one. you're not going to take my Flash away from me. All right. I, I, <laughs> there you go. I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't like it as an item. I think it's good as a summoner. But I would be okay if they change summoners to make them more kind of like aggressively weighted. Like if you flash when you're not in combat with a champion, it's like a slightly shorter cooldown. Mm -hmm. So like if you flash in on somebody and then they flash away from you, like you get the advantage out of that trade. I think things that just incentivize aggression and like making things happen are, are always good for the game. That's cool. This one comes from Turdy Boy 962 I have a question for the Community Questions episode. What is your favorite season in LOL history? Could be an entire season or even just like a meta. I feel like everyone, says, or 16? everyone always says something between season five and season seven. But at this point, I don't even know if they were actually the best seasons or if it's just kind of rose tinted glasses. But it that's the answer I feel like everyone gives. Yeah, I mean, it's tough because in any meta, like, there's going to be some good, some bad. I, I remember, like, season five, I had really good memories. Season eight, I had a good time. Uh, I mean, anything where junglers were forced to build, like, that aura, Aegis aura, probably wouldn't get my vote. That that was, like, so awful. Yeah. Um, But I, I think the game now is pretty good, honestly. Yeah. I mean, is if it's esports history, I the 2015 and 16 is just my favorite by far. League was so overwhelmingly big. It just really felt like everyone knew about it. Everyone, you know, would recognize us no matter where we went and everyone cared about League. You could talk to any like everyone knew the big matches. We were filling Madison Square Garden. Then we had, uh, you know, MSI where we actually did well. North America had some hope and we got second place and all this stuff. I was just like, oh my goodness, that was, that's my favorite for sure. I don't, and I don't think because of like the Rose Tinted Gladys, I don't think that's ever going to be replaced unless like NA wins Worlds or something. Then yeah. that'll, that'll buy, buy So deep. this year, there you go. Yeah, this year, there we all go. Right. Uh, this one, this will, this will be our last one, I think. Uh, this one's from John Doe. Uh, so is there is there any way for Riot to basically bridge the gap between pro play and solo queue regarding ADCs? They're not weak to be very clear, but they're unsatisfying. It feels like the entire class is pro jailed and it's more than a little frustrating. I kind of relate to this a bit because um I mean I play Phil. When I play AD, I don't even think the I don't think the role is bad by any means, but I do think it's pretty unfun in solo queue because it often feels like by the time you're going to be a part of the game, the game is already decided. Like it feels like you, you have to farm so much. And you're kind of like so linked to, to getting gold and playing for that um, more so than than other roles that I play. That it feels like by the time, it, like oftentimes, by the time it's ready and you're like, all right, I got my two or three items, the game feels decided one way or the other, and it feels like, oh, was I did I really even matter here? It's a bit of a prisoner dilemma in my mind for for AD carry because. Uh, it, I think it has to do with how many different buffs there are for AD carries, whether it's like Knight's Vow, all the Enchanter items, Enchanters themselves, mm -hmm. uh, because the difference between an Aphelios by himself with nothing, he's he's pretty weak, right? Oh, but all of a sudden you put like a Lulu and Ivern with him and he's just mowing God. your entire team down, unavoidable autos from super far away and like there's no counterplay, you can't kill him, then it gets kind of ridiculous. So I actually think if they just removed a lot of the tools that buff teammates they could actually increase the base level of 80 carries. So it's a little bit more in the same range. It's like, you don't need an enchanter to be super strong. Um, and yeah, and yeah I, I think it would give them a lot more agency. It, it is tough because it's one of those things where when you're, when ADC is played, like when your team is playing around you really, really well, it's just has felt like for forever by far the strongest role in the game. Right. And that is just pro play. Mm -hmm. um, you play around your ADC, you're not even just itemization and stuff, but like how your team is positioning, how your team is peeling when they're doing that perfectly, you are a God, right? If you play it really well. Um, but oftentimes in solo queue, your team's not going to play around you. They might not be itemizing around you. The game is kind of faster and scrappier, which often means if you're coming online later, you feel like you have less effect. So it is hard. I think what you're saying is, is a good idea. I also think the other angle is take away some of the scaling power and make them stronger early. So they feel like maybe they can be more of kind of like an, an impact on the early game. And the, the issue there, like how do you keep them out of solo lanes? Yeah. You can't, I guess. Yeah, it's it's tough. I think there's probably some solution, but 
I'm not a game designer, so I'll let them take care of it. I mean, right. there's really ham-fisted stuff like they can do where it's like you link power like with Lucian. What they did is they made it so it's like his passive is linked to other people. Yeah. And you can do like like Neela. It's like your passive experience is linked to being by another pr- person. So it's like ham-fisted stuff where you can be like, you must go bot lane with two people or your champion sucks. But that also feels kind of bad when it's forced that way. Yeah. But it's also just that feeling is an is a bri- byproduct of the archetype of the of the role of being a glass cannon. Sometimes, yeah. like in, in one view, oh no, you know, someone got on me and jumped on me, and my team's not playing around me. Oh, this is this is garbage. I'm just a bag of gold for the enemy team. Oh, I am a glass cannon, and you know, I'm being protected, and I have room to play, and I'm just blowing everyone up. Oh, great! It's the best role in the whole game. Yeah, one thing that I, I think might be a good direction for AD carry is making them a little bit more. Uh, like I feel like Bork should be like a core item on most AD carries because if you think about what the role does, right? It's you know it's the one that kills the front line. It's the consistent damage. It takes objectives, takes turrets and whatnot. But for a long time, they've kind of just they've killed front lines by having crit and a ton of damage. So yeah, they're killing front lines, but they're also two shotting any carry. And I feel like AD carries shouldn't really be that insane. It, like they shouldn't be an assassin, is in in my opinion. I think they should maybe have more like percent damage type stuff. And that would make them, you know, if you're behind, it wouldn't feel as bad. If you're ahead, it doesn't feel as bad. Like to play higher against. sustained damage, but like less bursty. Yeah, yeah, something like that. I think yeah. would would probably be good. The only problem is like everybody has burst damage now. <laughs> it's like bruisers have burst damage, tanks have burst damage. Yeah, everybody's got to have burst now. Yeah, it is tough. All right, uh, this was a fun episode. It actually went a lot longer than I thought. That's going to wrap it up for us right now. Thank you, everyone, for sending in your questions. Even just on Twitter, we got like 150. We got tons in YouTube and other places as well. So appreciate everyone sending in all those questions. Hope you enjoyed this episode. We're going to be getting back to what the normal ones are, obviously, as LCS is going to be back this weekend. So we'll have a regular episode next week. And remember, if you're watching us on YouTube, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode of The Dive. You can also check us out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Anchor.fm. Continue you sending us your questions use the hashtag the dive lol so we can find those for more episodes like this and be sure to tune in this weekend for lcs week five starting march 2nd at 1 p.m it's going to be FlyQuest taking on cloud nine we'll see you there